So the first thing that we're going to talk about now is, um, I guess, uh, the easiest step of anything that interfaces with an external language. Um, we use Weeb quite a bit for prototyping. It's also used um, uh, in, in production environments as well, but it's a really nice tool for just trying. You find some hot spot in your application that's really slow. I want to try a different algorithm in there. It also has some tools where you don't actually have to write any C or C++ to get some of the speed benefits. So we'll go over those. Um, the notion here, just to, to discuss, I mean, the general uh, notion is that we're going to have some kind of C code or Fortran code that we want to execute. And what you have to do to interface that into Python is you really have to write a wrapper function around this. And that wrapper function is going to take a Python. A Python integer is actually a structure. It's not like your int in C. I mean, it has a structure that has information about the type of the variable and, and, and uh, uh, what its add operations are and all kinds of things like that. So, uh, I mean, like math operations, add, subtract, things like that. So, the the if we take one of these data structures, um, we have to unpack it and actually pull the integer value that we want out of that object and make it an int so that we can call our C code. Well, and then we call our C code, we get an integer value maybe returned from the function. We have to pack that value back up as a Python variable before we pass it back to Python. Uh, so there's this unpacking and packing process that always happens around your function call. Uh, if you're interfacing with Python. Well, we kind of handles this all, this packing, unpacking process for you. That's why it's the easiest example uh, to kind of go over. And there are really three different sets of tools. We'll mainly cover the first two, and I think I'll probably dance over the last one. But Blitz is a tool that allows you to, um, Blitz is a C++ library that, that is, does fast vector algebra or vector math and it, you remember the slicing operations we talked about all day yesterday and all of that? Well, you can do that in C++ with Blitz. And so C++, our numeric ex NumPy expressions look very much like Blitz expressions, just ones in Python and ones in C. So we will do the translation of your NumPy expression to a Blitz expression, do the wrapping and unwrapping of the variables for you, compile that or create the wrapper, compile the wrapper and load it on the fly so that you don't see that, that process. Uh, there's also, or don't have to deal with that process. So that's one approach. There's also a thing that allows you to inline C code directly in your, your application. Uh, and then extension tools is, is something that allows you to build a standalone extension. So we'll go through some examples here. This will actually work from a, if you try this example from IPython, it won't quite work right. It will work right from because IPython does something with standard out, it's not the standard uh, output that C uses uh, when it writes out. And what this example does is, it's a quick example that we set a variable a equal one, uh, we dot inline standard out. We're writing the standard out here, the variable a, and then we're writing an end of line character. This is basically a printf or a print statement for C++. Just prints out a. And then what we tell it is this variable a needs to cross from Python into C. And what happens is it's going to print out uh, under the covers. This goes off, takes that little line, puts it in some boilerplate C++ code that does the wrapping and unwrapping of a from an integer uh, into a, 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 a C integer, calls your function. And then in this case, all it does is prints out one, right? Uh, that's not very interesting, but it is kind of nice to know that it's done everything for you in the background. You haven't had to do anything. Well, what comes up, if you call it a second time, that function is already there, so it doesn't recompile it, right? So you don't have that compile step. Well, what happens if you say A is equal to a string? C, C++ is not a dynamic language like Python is. When you have variable A, you say it's an int, it has to be an int. So what it uh, happens here, it calls the function, but it finds out, oops, that was a string, I expected an int. 
And so it's smart enough to go in and say, okay, I'm going to recompile this. And it recompiles it. And now it keeps, it keeps track of two versions of the same function. One for integers, one for strings. And you can call it with QWERTY here. And if you call it again, obviously it doesn't uh, recompile it. But if you go ahead and do uh, change A back to 01 and recall it, it's immediate because it keeps, a, it keeps track of that. If you kill the application and restart, there will be a slight pause when you run one of these things because it has to go find the external module and load it. But there is no recompile step. So I'll just do a quick example here. Uh, a slightly different one, but uh, we'll make A equal to 1. And there's some magic variables that, that occur in Weed. Uh, and one of them is called return val. So return val, if I assign a variable to return val, then that's going to be returned from the function. So if we do this, I'll run that. We go off, it does some compiling, and then the output was 1. Now if we run this again, the output again is 1. A is equal to uh, QWERTY. It goes off and compiles. It's still there. A is equal to 1. Still there. So, you, you know, you haven't had to do a whole lot of work here to be able to actually interface with, with C, uh, C++, and write an algorithm that's fairly small, or write short algorithms and try it out. So you can create a support code, right? We've, we've created an extra string up here. We call that support code, and that's just a C++ function or a C function. And what we do is we say, okay, I want to call this function called Bob and return the value from it, stick it in return value, and that's going to be returned from the application. But Bob's not defined in here, right? So we just pass in the, the thing that defined Bob as some support code. That's just going to be pasted before this function at the top. And then we're going to pass in the variable A, and this runs beautifully. We get our one back. However, we come in and we pass in a string. What's going to happen when you call Bob with the signature int val with a string? No luck, right? It's going to die. And so this error message is, it's not, we don't, there's some pretty raw stuff that comes out of Weave sometimes, especially when you're developing you still have to be able to interpret and understand C++ error messages that are going to occur. The other thing that you're going to want to learn is where these files, this file is actually a real file written out someplace, right? So when you're debugging things, you go look at that file and see what the heck's gone wrong. But here, you know, it's saying Bob can't convert parameter 1 from a pi string into an int because I need to have that as an int. And so you don't get away completely from having to know C, C++ uh, when, you're, when you're trying to debug these things. Uh, the first thing we have to do is we have to allocate the arrays, right? Uh, we have to allocate this temporary array, so we call them malloc. And then the next thing we do is we go through a loop and we just add these values together and assign those out to temp. Very straightforward. But then we come along and we have to allocate a new array to do the second part and we do a loop, call another loop and we go through it. Instead you do a little something, a little, something a little more like this and this fuses those loops, it combines those loops into one loop <clears throat> and notice you really don't have to keep up with any uh, temporary variables. I mean there aren't any, you just need the, the output value, we're just assigning into C, we can, uh, uh, we can do that there. And so this might be the more likely way uh, that somebody would write this algorithm and you haven't done any, um, you haven't had to do any memory allocation uh, and you've used the loops. This is going to be much faster than this algorithm over here. You have a whole lot less memory thrashing from the cache, you have a lot more, uh, you have a fused loop so you're doing more operations so you're allowing the, 
the compiler to, to do the best pipelining it can for operations. You're doing more operations on objects that are in the when they're in the registers. It's just a faster, much faster approach. Well, so we go from this to something that looks like this. Well, this is uh, what's called a F, an FDTD update equation, <clears throat> and it just has kind of a, a, a position dependent constant. So it depends upon where you are in the grid. Every grid element is going to have a different constant. We have a constant here that we multiply by an E value, then you're calculating a curl over here. So you have another constant and another constant. It's just, uh, and you're doing derivatives. You're, you remember the offsets we were doing yesterday to calculate a derivative? This is exactly the same sort of thing. We're doing a, a, you know, a derivative in the y direction and then one in the z direction. So this is a finite, this is a fairly complex actually finite difference equation uh, expressed fairly succinctly in Python. But there are a lot of operations. There are like seven math operations here uh, that, that have to be done. So you can write this in Python. It works pretty well. Uh, <clears throat> but you can take this and you can just put quotes around it, make it a string, uh, and then hand it into Blitz. And Blitz actually takes this expression, it parses it, it creates the abstract syntax tree for it, it walks that tree and reconstructs a C++ expression that's exactly the same, or does the same operation, and then it compiles it under the covers, and it runs it. And so all of a sudden, you, you've taken this thing where we create all these temporary variables, and that goes away because when it makes it in the C, it, doesn't, it fuses those loops together and makes a single loop. So does this make a difference? Well, you can see how old these are. I really need to update the timings on this slide. Uh, I mean, we're talking numeric 17. The last version of numeric was 24 before we went to NumPy. But this gives you an idea of <clears throat> what the performance is. So if we look at this, if we use numeric on this simple equation and then do it using um, the Blitz uh, compiler, then we have a speed up of 1.13. It's almost negligible. But if you look at this expression, you kind of would expect that. For a large array, <clears throat> 512 by 512, most of the operations are really the math and A equal B plus C, well numeric ought to be able to do that very fast because it's not really doing anything strange. It has to allocate the temp, it's going to add those, well all of those have to happen here. When you do A equal B plus C plus D, it's a little larger and you're actually seeing a speed up with the blitz of a factor of two. Then when you get to that FDTD, it's actually about three, it's not so bad. Now, if you look at double precision, in the past, double precision was performance in NumPy was not, or numeric was not very good. I think NumPy does better than this. But we were seeing a factor of speed up of around 9. And all you had to do to get that factor of speed up of 9 was take this expression that you wrote down here, convert it to a string so it's exactly the same, and call this. So it's a small amount of work to get quite a bit of benefit. It's the easiest way to get a speed up. The thing to be careful about with Blitz is it doesn't work with every, it doesn't handle broadcasting. So if you have a numeric expression that has broadcasting, Blitz isn't going to solve that problem for you. Uh, but it handle, and we found one other condition it didn't handle a few days ago. But most conditions, uh, it should handle most, most of your general equations as long as you don't have broadcasting in them. Here's your five point stencil, right? So if you take that, you get a factor of, so you could take, one of the things you could do today is just take that stencil that you created, put quotes around it, call weave.blitz on it, and compare the speed between the two. Also compare that the results are the same, which you hope will happen. All right, so here's a slightly different uh, view, uh, look at Blitz that kind of compares Blitz and, and inline. <clears throat> here's Laplace's equation, and this is an update where we're doing we're running Laplace's equation on this grid and we have a voltage set at the top, a ground on all the bottom edges. And so the voltage, you, if you iterate the Laplace's equation, it will iterate until you have the, the voltage across the whole grid at all of these internal points. So you have the pure Python version. You can use numeric uh, on the same problem set. And this is one of the interesting problems. Notice at the bottom what we're doing is we're trying to calculate an error 
uh, we're watching the error go down on this problem. This is a place where vectorization actually doesn't do very well, and here's why. In this case, when we're calculating the error value, when we change a pixel, we need to compare the old value to the new value, right? Well, that's really, you only have to do that. I mean, if you're doing that in a for loop in C or C++, you can just calculate what is the error of that single value. And then if you're just accumulating the error across the whole grid, you can just sum up as you're going through the loop and keep track of the error. And that's what we're doing right here. We're just calculating the difference between this temporary. We save out the old value, calculate the new one, calculate the difference, and add that to the error. Well, if you're doing this, you can do all of this with slicing, but look what you have to do. We have to, if we're going to compare an error to the last values we had, we have to have the last values around. But I'm writing my new values over here directly into my old values, right? So I'm just writing them over. Well, that means I have to copy the old array out. So this is a place where vector calculations cause you to uh, double your memory usage basically for the problem just to calculate the error. But you, want you, you can write this in numeric. It's much faster than the old version. We see the error value here. We can put all of this into blitz. We get a factor of speed up of about three if we put that update equation in blitz. We still use the old approach to, to calculate our error. And then uh, the third way is to actually write this as an inline. You can write this as C code, right? So this is a little more lorik. You have to write your for loops and that sort of thing. Uh, uh, here we have the for loop for i and for j, and we're looping across the arrays. We're using some, uh, when, we, when we come in, these look a little nicer than usually when you're usual when you write in C. Usually you have to do the pointer offset yourself and that sort of thing. <clears throat> blitz actually allows you to do indexing, so we're converting these to blitz arrays when we come in. Uh, and so these are actually U as a blitz array here. Uh, and we can do the same operation, but notice that we can just calculate the error here without having to allocate our new array uh, or allocate the old array. We're just comparing to the temporary old value. So we, we, don't, we haven't doubled our memory, and we're down to 4.3 seconds. You can actually write a faster version of this that doesn't blitz the the arrays they have have a little bit of overhead compared to doing the pointer offset calculations yourself. So if you make this uglier, you can actually cut it down a little more, and that comes in at 2.9 seconds. So if you look at all these, you're looking at a runtime of around 2,000 seconds for pure Python. Really, numeric is our benchmark here. But if you use blitz, you get a speed up of about 2.84. Inline, you're to six. Weave, you're to 10. And uh, using f to pi to just wrap something in Fortran, you're on the order of 10. And if you write a pure C program, it's slightly faster than the weave.inline version. And I actually don't know why that would be. I can't see why it would be actually any faster. It'd be interesting to rerun this on something slightly more modern than a Pentium 3 450, uh, as well as to, to see uh, if we can see where that, that difference comes in. But this is a nice study to give you an idea of what you can expect to see. A and this is not unusual. I mean, if you take an algorithm, we saw earlier that vector quantization went, had a factor of speed up of 25 that we showed yesterday. Here we're seeing a speed up of around 10. So you can expect if you take numeric code from Python to C, you can still expect getting a speed up between 5 and 25, right? rewriting the algorithm. That's not always true, but, but uh, it's true in a lot of places.